<clears throat> Sorry about the delay. Uh, you can write to Bill Gates. My, I have two systems, so I have redundancy, and both of them were not working. Anyway, we're now uh, talking about today's topic, which is boards and committees. And in Robert's Rules of Order, this is chapter 16. Exciting. They can hear me now. It is exciting like because um, e even though the terms are kind of dry, uh, boards include entities such as city councils and county commissions. And so if you have a dysfunctional um, county commission, uh, it might be why is because they're not following proper uh, rules of order. We just received a, um, a cache of videos made from a town called Carpenterville of what truly must be one of the most dysfunctional boards ever. And, huh. and it's a great learning experience to see, watch through this and say, really, this could have been addressed if they just followed proper procedure. Interesting. Well, I'm in chat, everybody. So we'll be listening to Larry inform us. And if you have any questions, just hit me up in chat and we will ask Larry. Thank you. So going to the first slide, uh, the definition of a board is that it is a body of elected or appointed persons that differ from other types of assemblies as follows. It's smaller and its operation is determined by powers delegated to it by an authority outside of itself. Um, so what that means is, you know, like in a county commission, it's probably created by the state government in a, uh, in a, in a uh, school board, it's, it's created by the school district, but it's created from something else. Um, so going to the next slide, examples of boards are county boards of commissioners, city councils, executive boards, and boards of directors. I just received material um, that goes into more depth on the application of Robert Schulz of order to uh, things like county commissions. And I'm gonna have a special edition focusing on that because there's uh, a lot of commissions that are finding that, that their underlying rules of orders are, are Robert's rules, but they're not following it. And so I'm gonna be helping them uh, figure out how to uh, apply them. That's cool. On the next slide, uh, it talks about the difference between boards and committees. And this is a subtle but important distinction. Uh, so a board is a form of assembly, uh, which means that they have all the rights and um, privileges under um, Robert's Rules of Order that, uh, that, that are granted. A committee is a sub subordinate of an assembly or an accountable, or is accountable to a higher authority in some way not characteristic of an assembly. So for one of the boards that we talk a lot about in these series are like the, the Rules Committee of the Democratic Party of Oregon. The Rules Committee is a creation of the Democratic Party of Oregon. And so it is subordinate to the assembly. Um, and what that means is that there are some things that it can't do, like it cannot pass its own rules of order uh, that it wants to follow, unlike a board. So a board can pass its own rules, a subcommittee cannot. If a subcommittee wants a rule, they have to go to their um, governing body and get it passed there. Can you clarify for me, Are you you mean like the committees, like what Ginny Burdick is on, like the actual rules committee in Senate, or is this a different rules committee? You're talking the rules committee of the DPO, right? I was talking about the rules committee of the DPO, okay, but okay. yeah, it, the, all the committees are the same because the, the Oregon Senate and the Oregon legislature follows Mason's rules of order. There's probably some differences in there okay. as opposed to Robert's rules of order, but yeah, it's a, it's the same concept. It's a committee. And what we're going to get into is some governing rules about committees that uh, are sometimes frustrating, but they're intended to make, uh, make the work of a committee more, um, more agile and easy. So in small boards and committees, most parliamentary rules apply, but certain modifications are permitted giving greater flexibility. So the term size comes into play, but uh, unfortunately Robert's rules uh, seems to uh, not come down specifically on how this applies. But when it talks to small boards and committees, it, it is really talking about 12 members or less. And so if you have a small board that's less than 12 members, then the committee and board rules should apply if they are larger 
then you'd have to go to the full-blown Robert Schulz of order for your operation. The exception to that uh, is that standing committees um, are considered committees, even if they're like the Democratic Party of Oregon Rules Committee, which has um, somewhere upwards of 22 members. So officers of boards, now this is on the board side. So there's two entities we're talking about and I hope I can make 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 make, clear, make it clear which I'm talking about. So on boards, which acts as assemblies, they, um, they are organized as any deliberative assembly and they have a chair or a president and a secretary and any other officers that are needed. needed. And again, they can adopt their own rules. So going to the next slide, and this is where the distinction comes in and how they operate. Um, so the first one is kind of nice. And, you know, members may raise their hand instead of standing. And that's because you're usually, you know, 12 people sitting around a table. And so it'd be a little weird to be standing up every time you wish to speak. So yeah, you can just raise your hand. Um, the next one uh, is one that it's hard to forget if you're used to regular meetings. So motions need not be seconded. That means that any motion that someone makes can can is 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 put out there does not need a second and you have to disposition it um, uh, and you can't disposition it by everyone just keeping their mouth shut and letting it die for lack of a second. Um, the next one also is sometimes challenging. Uh, there's no limit to the number of times a member can speak, and of course this is in the circumstance where no rules have been sort of grandfathered in um, uh, from a parent organization, but a small board could also adopt its own rules. So you, you, can, you can put limits on the numbers of times members can speak. Um, informal discussion is permitted while no motion is pending. This is one that you have to watch very carefully because uh, one of the ways in which uh, work can be stalled is just to let it go endlessly in discussion without anyone making a motion and getting some kind of action uh, uh, being deliberated upon, deliberated upon. And then the last one, if the chairman is a member of the committee, the chairman may speak in informal discussions and debate and vote. So ordinarily the chairperson is supposed to be neutral and their role is to, you know, facilitate the will of the people of the assembly, but in a committee and a small board, the chairman can participate and make their position known. Going to the next slide, there's two types of committees. Uh, there are standing committees, which have continued existence. And then there's special committees, which go out of existence as soon as they have accomplished and completed this specific task. Um, so bylaws specify, uh, uh, let's go to the next slide. Members of standing committee serve for a term corresponding to that of the officers, unless the bylaws otherwise expressly provide. A standing committee must be construed, constituted by name, by, by name, by provisions in the bylaws or by a special rule of order. So a standing committee cannot exist unless it is listed in the bylaws for all intents and purposes. Um, and then the last one is, uh, important. If certain standing committees are enumerated in the bylaws, there shall be no others unless the bylaws are amended. So if you want to create another standing committee, and this is an ongoing committee as opposed to one that ends when it completes its task, you need to amend the bylaws. Um, so if you want a membership committee and you want that to be ongoing, you need that to, and you want it to be a standing committee, then you need to uh, amend your bylaws to get that created. The next slide on, on where they report is very important because we often get leaders who think that they're not public servants, but they're leading the assembly and they're directing it like they're a CEO. Um, but this is also true of the other officers as well. It's not like everyone reports to the chair or the president, they all report to the assembly. And in the case of standing committees, standing committees report to the assembly and not to the executive board or the board of directors, unless the bylaws permit otherwise. Uh, this this has bearing on how they decide what to do. I mean, are they are they doing this to protect the president, or are they doing this to 
uh, on the work of the assembly. And clearly, in a in a deliberative society, they're doing their work on behalf of the, of the assembly. Going to the next slide on special committees, a special committee may not be appointed to perform a task that falls within the assigned function of an existing standing committee. This is a way in which uh, some chairs might possibly try to get around uh, a group of people that they don't like. Like if they don't like uh, the majority of the members of the rules committee, uh, they might think they can create a special committee to do something that's really in a responsibility of the rules committee, but they can select their own members, they can get their own way. Uh, that's expressly forbidden in Robert's Rules of Order. Any questions yet, John? No, nobody's got any questions. They're absolutely memorized. There's, there's, Me there's, memorized. There are. There's six people watching right now. Thank you all six of you for being here today. It's a Sunday and we're talking about Robert's Rules of Order. I, I know you could be elsewhere. Uh, appreciate that. There's no questions. I. I I have a question, but it's kind of a sideline on all of this, um, but we'll, we'll hit it at the end. So keep going. Uh, conduct of business in committees. Um, the quorum in a committee is a majority of its membership unless the assembly has prescribed a different quorum. So if you have 12, 12 members of a committee, you need seven members to have a quorum. Um, the next one is an, a circumstance that we recently experienced and have talked about. So the chair should call the meeting of the committee. That's a responsibility of the chair. If the chair fails to call a meeting, the committee must meet at the call of any two of its members. Um, so if you have a circumstance where the committee doesn't meet, and we've seen one committee in particular that hadn't met for eight months, uh, they don't have to put up with that. You don't get to control the work of a committee by not allowing it to spread to meet. So any two members can call a meeting and if they meet the notice requirements and a quorum requirements, then it's a valid meeting. And finally, motions to close or limit debate are not allowed in committees. So you can't call the question. And committees, like I said before, may not adopt their own rules unless they're authorized to do so. Going to the next slide, motions for actions. Committees present reports to the assembly. And then after receiving a report, an assembly normally considers whatever action may be recommended in or arise out of a report. So this goes back to how uh, deliberative assemblies actually accomplish their work. A deliberative assembly is there to deliberate and think upon things that are presented to them. If, a, if an organization has work to be done, that work is typically done in committees offline in between the regular meetings of the organization. So if you have a membership drive and the, the, uh, the membership committee is supposed to recruit 100 new members before the next meeting, uh, then they go off and they do that work in, bet in between the regular meetings. They prepare a report and they repair, prepare recommendations for the assembly to, uh, to adopt. And what this allows you to do then is have a small group of people put their minds together uh, and come up with some optimal solutions instead of having say 100 or 150 people at the meeting all trying to solve a problem. It's much more efficient to have something done inside a committee, especially if, if you have a committee comprised of, of you know, diverse opinions. Um, or people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> that's never helpful <laughs> sorry i'm just it helps you know calm the chaos right that's uh, it's, it's really smart in that way and what you hope is that we have people on these committees that actually know something about these areas maybe yes and we're encouraging people who have a background in in rules and parliamentary procedure to seriously consider running for the rules committee going forward i would uh, there are two current members in the Democratic Party of Oregon Rules Committee who, who are actually members of the National Association of Par Parliamentarians. There are a number of people who think because they own a copy of Robert's Rules, they're experts, and uh, it's, it's glaringly obvious that they're not. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? how it works with the bible anyway um Ooh. <laughs> I, yeah yeah no i i think this is important really this is important and and we've seen and you've demonstrated in the past these rules are how things get corrupted because people either break them or we're not paying attention or 
um, uh, you know, we're writing crappy rules uh, that give power to, to, you know, a few. So this is important stuff. Thank you, Larry. Next slide talks about minority reports. And of course, uh, we can go back to the famous uh, 2016 Nevada Delegate Selection Convention on an attempt to give a minority report. Um, if you remember the convention, the, a minor, minority report was from the Credentials Committee, and it was about um, it was about the deselection of uh, delegates, of which two thirds were Bernie Sanders supporters, and less than a third were Hillary Hillary uh, delegates. Uh, in in that convention, someone tried to give a minority report. Um, it you know if you review the video, you can tell that no one knows really pro how to properly handle it. Um, but this is what Robert Schul said. So minority report is a privilege that the assembly may accord, not a matter of right. So you don't have the right to give a minority report. However, uh, minority reports are given immediately after the report of the committee. And if someone objects to the presentation of the minority report, the chair should put the question on the report being received to the assembly. So what this means that if I, you know, Larry Taylor has a minority report that I want to give, then uh, after the chair of the committee uh, presents the, the regular report, then I would stand up to give the minority report. Um, and the chair should allow me to proceed unless someone objects. Uh, and usually this is done with the, the, the motion for unanimous consent. And then if someone objects, then the chair should ask the assembly if they want to hear the minority report. And then they take a vote. And if a majority of the members want to hear the minority report and perhaps get a second opinion on what's been going on, then they can do so. It's not up to the chair to squelch information. Okay, so then the whole room screams because they have some kind of a verbal vote <laughs> and then Roberta gets mad and leaves. All right, I got it. I got it. <laughs> That's what we're yeah, trying to do. Yes, exhibit A of not, how not to run a meeting. <laughs> right, right. All right. And on the next slide, so when a re minority report is presented, it is for information and cannot be acted upon except by a motion to substitute it for the report of the committee. So if I do a minority report and I give it after the regular report, someone in, in the assembly can say, hey, that makes a lot of sense. And clearly this committee was railroaded. And um, and so I move to adopt the minority report as a substitute for the, the committee report. And then if it's a seconded and if a majority adopts the minority report, then it becomes the report of the committee, including any recommendations then are, are brought before the committee. So the way the, way the committee reports uh, work, and I, I kind of talked about this previously. So in the in the in the meeting you you go through a series of reports from each of the committees and they talk about the work that they did since the prior meeting and if they concluded their work or if they have recommendations on on actions to take then uh they can say the things like well the the uh the membership committee moves to uh send out a mailing to the twelve thousand voters in the region uh uh for to solicit new membership because it comes from a committee, and by definition, committees are more than one person, um, it is, there's an implicit second. So you don't have to go for a second from a committee report. And then the committee then provides the motions to the assembly then to vote upon. So even though the committee has, decide, has, has made recommendations on actions to take, the assembly has to agree to them in order to proceed farther. So they could say, you know, these these motions are a bunch of bunch of hogwash. We're not going to do them, or we can't afford them, or for whatever reason, it's the majority of the assembly that gets to decide how to disposition the motions that come out of the committee. Does that make sense? Yes, as as much as all of this does. Yeah. <laughs> and you know some of this stuff doesn't make sense until you actually exercise it so uh it's 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 always good to revisit this material because it makes more and more sense the more times you read it and, and use this stuff uh, it's kind of like listening to somebody explain chess moves like okay exactly let me, let me just yeah. play the game and find out yeah. the next slide we talk about the committee of the whole and this is a uh, one of the weirdest names i've ever seen but <laughs> 
Um, what it talks about is when you can convert the whole assembly into a discussion group. And so this is when you drop the form formality of a deliberative assembly where people formally present motions and then you debate them and then you vote them up or down. Maybe you want to have a discussion to see where everyone's heads at on stuff. This was a this is the oldest form of a committee, and, and it was actually used in the when they were writing the constitution at the second constitutional convention. So, you know, if you remember, there were a bunch of issues like what are we going to do about this slavery issue? <laughs> that being one big one. Um, and so what Washington did when they came, when they would come across something that was just intractable, he would say, you know, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to leave you people to work this out. And so they would, they would adjourn the assembly and then they would go to a committee of the whole where they could have a discussion and they could do straw polls and take a sense of what people are thinking and have a free discussion. Um, uh, and then once they get a, a sense of where they're headed, then they come out of the committee of the whole and then they resume the regular assembly and the regular processes. So I, why do you find that funny? No, um, well, I didn't have my bike on, so I'm sorry. I was laughing so loud. It, I was just, oh. it just sounds like um, uh, just imagining the day. It's like, okay, everybody, we're going to leave the congressional room. We're going to go meet at the pub. Let's go talk at the pub. And then we'll go back to the congressional room whether they really went anywhere or not, right? And and because they're kind of just scrapping the, the formalities, you know? Right, because so they wants, need the hash out. Right, exactly, it needs a hash out. So if somebody wants to interrupt or raise their hand or go bullshit or whatever, that's what happens, right? No. I mean, I doubt that happens today, but you know what I mean. Uh, the committee provides conclusions for the assembly to act upon. So, uh, you know, hopefully they would come, they would craft motions then to present to the assembly. And there are two variations of this. So the, the true committee of the whole is where George Washington or whoever the presiding officer is just gets up and leaves the room and does not influence the discussion and then comes back and, and, and then resumes the assembly. There's the quasi whole, which is the even more weird name for it. Uh, but that's where George stays and moderates the meeting. Uh, and so you could do a quasi whole, you, you know, you just, you're sitting in the same room as the same set of people. You're just basically going into an informal discussion mode uh, to talk about it. And then there's informal consideration, which is the third form. And I actually don't understand the distinction of that. But those are the three variations of committee of a whole that, that you can use. Like choose your level of comfy? Is like yes. Do we want George in the room to... George and and, uh, and Ben, would you please get the hell out of here so we can <laughs> talk about you? We can talk. We can get all the slave owners, right. you know, all the all the big slave owners out of here. Ah, uh, yes. So if you want to read more about Committee of the Whole, and and uh, to be honest, this was a concept that eluded me for a long time. These are pages five thirty one to five forty two in Robert's Rules of Order. So that's the whole presentation on uh, on the uh, committees and boards. And like I said, I'm going to have a future one talking about how uh, like a county commissioner board would operate uh, uh, and who the who the members are and who gets to speak and how Robert's Rules translates to that format um, uh, at a future date. Any questions from the line? There, there has been zero activity other than James earlier today. Thank you for all five of you that are still here, but we have no, <laughs> no wood in chat. I, my, my question, you know, you're talking about, my expanded question was really just, you, you've been talking about um, this as it applies to like the DPO and the committees or how it applies to like a county, uh, d you know, Democratic Party. How, how, who picks the committee members of say the Oregon Senate and how are they governed? There should be rules that specify how this is done. Uh, and so there's there's two documents in the Oregon legislature. There's Mason's Rules of Order, which is their, their equivalent of Robert's Rules of Order. Okay. And then there's the Senate rules. And uh, I would suspect that the Senate rules, well, one of those two documents will contain, contain it. But um, in, in reality, what happens in Salem is that the, the Speaker of the House and the Senate President pick the members of the committees. Ah, okay. Which gives them great power. If you remember... Uh, the the uh, the I think it was a senator from the Douglas County Douglas County area 
uh, after the sexual harassment um, complaints came out, um, he was charged with um, smoking in the building. He was removed from all of the committees that he was uh, a member of. And they took the door off of his office, apparently. Um, apparently, those are extra powers that the Senate president has. But he was taken off of all the committees. And and the, just like in a, any in organization, a lot of the work uh, of the legislation is done inside of committees. They hold committee hearings and uh, they have discussions and then they, they, they formulate the legislation. If you are not on a committee, you don't have anything to do in Salem until the assembly convenes, which might um, uh, not happen for a couple of weeks sometimes. And so if you've been thrown off of all the committees, you don't have a lot to do. Well, and if everybody takes a look at Vote Smart, just pick your pick a, a, a anybody, right? You'll see that the people on the committees make the money. <coughs> they got the money. The people on the committees get the money, and it depends on what committee it is. So, yeah, that's there. There's where the power is brokered, right there, because that's where bills are killed and made, right? Yep. Yeah. So this and that's that's the power place. Thank you, Larry. It's been great. What else do you have to tell us? Uh, just a reminder, if you would like to study this stuff in more depth, we have the Cascadia E-Unit, which you are welcome to join. We meet virtually, so we use uh, the same technology we're using this meeting, the Zoom uh, uh, conference application. Uh, and we have a program laid out for the rest of the year where we're studying various topics of Robert Tools of Order in depth. And the great benefit of this is that you can talk and have a discussion with people who uh, who might be more experienced with this. I've been a member of the Rose City unit, which meets physically together for about two years now. And it's been enormously helpful in in talking through these issues because once you you come from a you know a particular uh, perspective, it's it's hard to get out of that frame of mind and into how this stuff is viewed more more generally. Uh, and uh, it's it's just really good to have other people explaining to you um, how this stuff works. Because to really understand it, you need to go through Robert's book that he wrote on parliamentary procedure, which is sort of the underlying document to all this stuff. Yeah, too much reading. Too much. So if you'd like to join, uh, you can go to um, um, Is it PDPO or Advancement of Democracy? Advancement of Democracy. I was going through all my slides. There's a <laughs> Nominal fee to join the group, uh, but because we will soon be associated with the National Association of Parliamentarians, nice. um, that allows you to join that group as well, and then that gets you uh, involved in their activities. Which there's a local, there's a local annual meeting where they have seminars and tutorials, and then there's the national meeting. The next, the last national meeting was in Buffalo last month, and the next one is going to be uh, in Las Vegas next year. Oh, closer. Are you going to go? Absolutely. Yeah, Vegas. Yeah, party time for all those parliamentarians. parliamentarians. <laughs> yeah, those wild and crazy <laughs> parliamentarians. <laughs> what you parliament stays in Vegas. All right. Uh, reference material. Uh, if you saw me in a previous one, I misstated. I, I took something from Amazon as being a truism, and it turns out it's not. So Robert's Rule of Order 11th edition is probably going to be in effect through 2020. And then in 2020, they're going to come out with the 12th edition. And uh, probably that's how long we have to wait for the Kindle edition as well. So your Robert's Rules of Order edition 11 is perfectly valid uh, for the next year and a half. Outstanding. Uh, if you want the abbreviated version, there's Robert's Rule of Order, newly revised in brief. That covers all the topics that you use for 80% of the challenges you come across inside of meetings. And you should be able to pass the qualifying exam for the National Association of Parliamentarians if you just uh, comprehend this book. And the book can actually be read in one day. And the one that uh, currently uh, is valuable is the study guide for regis the registration examination. This is the battery of five tests you take to actually become a registered parliamentarian. Uh, and you can go out and uh, with some confidence uh, help chairs arbitrate their meetings. Travel the world. Travel the world. Apparently. <laughs> get get tra tax write-offs like Jared Kushner. 
Is that what he, is he a parliamentarian? No, probably not. He just gets right off because he's a rich white he, guy. Yes. He knows Trump. Excellent, Larry. This is all great information. Thank you so much. Are we Thanks, good? everyone, for joining. Yeah. We always have a song, as always, you know. Earlier today, Larry, I played the happy or the, the more jovial talk in Vietnam potluck, right? Tom Paxson. So I thought we'd go out with the serious one by Phil Oaks. Because yeah. what he says hasn't changed either. <laughs> so it's unfortunate. Thanks, everybody. We do this because we have to change things. Sailing over to Vietnam, Southeast Asian Birmingham. Well, training is the word we use, nice word to have in case we lose. Training a million Vietnamese to fight for the wrong government and the American way. Well, they put me in a barracks house just across the way from Laos. They said you're pretty safe when the troops deploy, but don't turn your back in your house, boy. When they ring the gong, watch out for the Viet Cong. Well, the sergeant said it's time to train, so I climbed aboard my helicopter plane. We flew above the battleground, a sniper tried to shoot us down. He must have forgot we're only trainees. Them commies never fight fair. Friends, the very next day we trained some more. We burned some villages down to the floor. Yes, we burned out the jungles far and wide. Made sure those red apes had no place left to hide. Threw all the people in relocation camps. Under lock and key, made damn sure they're free. Well, I walked through the jungle around the bend. Who should I meet but the ghost of President Diem? Said you're fighting to keep Vietnam free for good old democracy. That means rule by one family and 15,000 American troops, give or take a few thousand American troops. He said I was a fine old Christian man Ruling this backward Buddhist land Well, it ain't much, but what the heck It sure beats hell at a Chiang Kai shack I'm the power elite Me in the seventh fleet He said meet my sister, Madam New The sweetheart of DNBN food He said meet my brothers, meet my aunts With a government that doesn't take a chance Families that slay together, stay together. Said if you want to stay, well, you have to pay over a million dollars a day. But it's worth it all, now don't you see? If you lose the country, you still have me. Me and Sigmund Rhee, Chiang Kai-shek, Madam New. Like I said on Meet the Press, I regret that I have but one country to give for my life. Well, now old DM is gone and dead. All the new leaders are anti-red. Yes, they're pro-American freedom sensations against Red China and the United Nations. Now all the news commentators and the CIA are saying, thank God for coincidence.